G'day. So how do you get your software as a medical device approved? In the last video, I talked about Sandy and its current challenges for developers, regulators, and consumers. I said that Sandy itself isn't new, but that easy distribution and access to high-powered computing has changed the way that it's been used and what it can be used to do. This makes Sandy products uh, powerful tools in health and medicine, but there's also risk associated with using them. Now, this is why governments are choosing to regulate Sandy and also to introduce specific regulations for Sandy. So what are the risks associated with Sandy? Generally, they're not physical harm. Okay, hardware products have the potential to cause physical harm. Difficult to conceive a situation where software by itself can cause physical harm. However, it can indirectly cause harm. Now, this could be done, uh, for example, by contributing to an incorrect diagnosis, prescribing an inappropriate therapy, or potentially controlling another medical device that can cause physical harm. Now, importantly, these are not hypothetical risks. Okay, if you look through the adverse event databases in various jurisdictions, you will see situations where software has caused harm. For example, incorrect calculations of doses has been shown and inappropriate control of hardware leading to harm has been shown. Also breach, software breach, extraction of data or corruption of data has also occurred. This, these aren't new incidents either, okay, these have happened, some of them nearly a decade ago, because again, SAMD itself is not a new concept. So now that we've looked at what's special about SAMD, how do you get it approved? In general, the process for getting SAMD to market in most countries is the same as for other medical devices. Although there are usually some regulations that are specific to software or products that include software. In Australia, the regulation uses the term programmed and programmable medical device. In Europe, they talk about medical device software in the legislation. Now, the special regulations or the fact that there are special regulations is not special. Many types of medical devices have special regulations to consider their specific risks. So products that use radiation have specific rules. Products that deliver energy have specific rules. Products that are implantable have specific rules. Okay, that, that itself is not special. In Australia and Europe, the special rules are really based around how sanity products are classified. There's a special set of classification rules that make sure these products get appropriate scrutiny. There are some details in the essential principles of safety and performance, which are laid out as well, that make reference to programmed or medical device software. Now, apart from how it can potentially cause harm, it's also different because of how it's manufactured. This is important because um, in many countries, regulators focus on the manufacturer of the medical device rather than the product itself. And what they do is they certify the manufacturer to make that type of medical device rather than assess every single product that manufacturer makes. For Sandy, this effectively means that regulators certify the developer and certify their development life cycle to make a particular type of Sandy that does a particular type of thing. Otherwise, the general process for getting SAMD to market is very similar to other medical devices. You need, typically, you need to build a quality management system to manage your processes for development. That should be conforming to an appropriate standard. Often it's one ISO 13485. Software usually has an additional expectation that the software development life cycle will be built around the international standard IEC 62304 and then as with other medical devices you'll be expected to manage the risk and that's usually done with ISO 14971. Once you've got that in place you'll be able to apply for conformity assessment or the equivalent assessment and get certified as a developer to make a particular type of medical device, in this case a particular type of SAMI. You then need to design, test, and validate your software in line with not just software engineering best practice, but 
best practice for the medical application that it's going to be used for and clinical evaluation best practice. Once you've got that, you'll be able to apply to take that product to market. Now, the exact process will, of course, differ between jurisdictions, okay? But in countries that are members of the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, or the IMDRF, that general process will be the same and the underlying principles will be the same. But every country always has unique challenges that it needs to deal with, so they often have little unique details in their regulations that sit over the top of that basic process. And this is a good thing um, that this is so well harmonised because it means if you can build a good quality management system and a solid software development life cycle, then you'll be able to use that as the basis to enter multiple markets because the regulatory requirements in, in so many markets will be very similar and the expectations will be very similar. There's also very good international standards like the ones I mentioned just before, which give developers and manufacturers good guidance on how to build those systems. Now, the US is often called out as a bit of an outlier with their method of regulating medical devices. This is because their focus tends to be very much more on the product itself. Although they do assess manufacturers in their, in their QMS, they don't really certify them the same way that other manufacturers do. And certainly the focus is, is quite different. However, what we've seen with SAMD is the US use it as an opportunity to align a little bit better with other jurisdictions. And they've introduced their pre-certification program for SAMD developers, which in essence allows you as a developer to be certified to make a particular type of SAMD rather than having to get every product assessed. Now, although the, the focus is on the developer, the, the manufacturer, the high-risk products or the products with the potential to cause more severe harm will often be required to undergo design examination. In Australia and Europe, that's class three medical devices. So if your SAMD is class three, it's likely to need a design examination by the regulator or the competent authority. The basic process though is the same as for other medical devices. You will compile a dossier or technical file, sometimes called medical device file, and you will submit that for examination. The assessor will determine if it meets the um, requirements for that kind of product. And if it does, you'll be certified and you'll then be able to take the product to market. The other big difference with SAMD is, and software in general, is how it's updated and revised. Okay, with, with physical products to revise them, you change the design and you validate. Then to get it manufactured, you will need to change and revalidate your manufacturing line. You'll need to produce physical product before it goes to market. Or you may need to take action on products in the field to go out and service them and do some sort of update in the field. That's not how it works with software, right? Um, software devs typically design their update, develop it and test it. They integrate it with the main uh, development line and, and test integration. And then assuming everything passes requirements, they'll just push that out to market as an update. Because of that, I often get asked the question, does a regulator have to assess every single change I make to my product? In most countries, generally, the answer is no. Okay, and this is again because of the focus on the developer. Okay, if you've got a conformity assessment certificate or, or equivalent certification, you've been assessed by a regulator as and certified to develop that kind of SAMD. Okay, so they've said yes, we trust that you've got the processes to risk assess, to control design, to appropriately control production and release, and that you have an appropriate software development lifecycle. Okay, so the focus is on you as a developer, which means you as a developer need to assess all changes made to your product for their risk and their impact on performance and safety. The regulator won't necessarily do that, and generally there's no requirement to, as long as you're operating within the scope of your certification. Now, a lot of people misinterpret that. It says, great, once I'm through the gate, I can make whatever changes I want. No, that's not true. You need to assess them, 
and if you're not assessing them and following your certified QMS processes, the regulators will catch you out in the monitoring audits. Okay, they don't just audit you at the beginning, they audit you periodically to make sure that you are still using good practice and to reissue your certificate when it expires. Okay, all of that said, there are reasons where you will need to tell the regulator about what's going on. Typically, they fall into two categories. The first category being reportable incidents like adverse events, recalls, and other things related to safety and essential performance. Okay, many jurisdictions will have requirements for incidents that must be reported to the regulator. And usually there will then be some process to collaborate with the regulator to help resolve that issue or get information out to your customers or, or that sort of thing. The other category is typically for those high classifications, so class threes in Australia. They've undergone a design examination, so the, the design itself has been looked at by the regulator. There'll often be a requirement in those jurisdictions for those same products to have significant design changes assessed before they go to market. Now, you as a developer are expected to be able to make the assessment on whether something is significant or not, but you can always seek you know, assistance from the regulator there. But you can expect that if you've got a product that, that had to be assessed to get into market, that big changes that affect the safety or essential performance of that product will need to be assessed by the regulator. But that doesn't mean even for those products that every single update needs to be assessed. Okay, if they're minor things that have no impact on safety or performance, you may be able to make those updates without assessment. So that's a summary of getting SAMD into the market, getting it approved. Once again, as we see, although the SAMD products themselves that we see coming out are new and interesting and making big changes in health and medicine, there isn't a whole lot that's special about the way they're regulated. They use the existing mature process in most countries. As always with regulation, you need to look specifically at the requirements for your product in the market that you're selling it into. I'm Dr. Lee Walsh from Platypus Technical. Thank you for watching and please let us know what you'd like to see in future videos.